first session today, we're going to talk about tongues and interpretation. Speaking in tongues is the initial evidence of receiving the Holy Spirit. Scripture says, on the day of Pentecost, man spoke as the Spirit gave utterance. In Acts 2 and verse 4, we read, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I need to point out here that began is a transitive verb and what it does is it suggests a continuance of action. So other tongues here uh, is from the Greek word heteros meaning other kinds of tongues. In other words, they didn't speak all the same kind of tongue. This means that they, that in actual fact, as we look through the scriptures there, we find that there were 15 different language groups or regions which are identified. So we see then some 120 people were filled, at least that would be the minimum on that day. We don't know if they all spoke known languages. As I've said, only 15 different regions here are identified for us. It's quite probable that some spoke with the tongues of angels as well. Paul writing to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, verse 1 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. So there could have been some angelic tongues amongst those that were speaking on the day of Pentecost. We don't really know. Whatever language it was, Peter identified the outpouring on Cornelius's household as being the same as the day of Pentecost. Yet he does not say that any identifiable languages were in actually actual fact heard. In Acts 11 verse 15, he recounts this. And the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. In the New Testament, tongues are both a sign and a gift. Tongues are a sign of our having received the Holy Spirit. That was the first evidence of it as we read through the Acts of the Apostles. But it's also a gift to be used for the benefit of others, as are all the gifts that God gives us. As a sign, there is no limitation put upon their use. To do so would have been to inhibit the Holy Spirit. And there is no evidence that some of those prayed for received whilst others did not. So tongues then as a gift. Let us look at that, shall we? In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual, in actual fact, the word pneumata there literally should be literally translated spirituals. And gifts you will note in your, uh, in your text is put in an italics, meaning that it's not there in the original uh, Greek text. So now concerning spirituals, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. Or alternatively, as concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Now, here is Paul's reason for writing. The church at Corinth was in absolute disorder over its use of the pneumata, and instruction was required in, before order could be returned to their gatherings. At the commencement of the chapter, there are nine spiritual gifts which are listed, and these are divided up into three groups of the following. At least we can divide them up that way. This isn't the order which they actually occur in the text. But the three voice gifts are tongues, interpretation, and we call those two a dual gift. In other words, they need to work in conjunction with each other. The third in that uh, listing, we would put prophecy. We then look at faith and healings and miracles and would put them into a category of being three power gifts. Then we come to three what we call revelation gifts, as the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, and discerning of spirits, which we covered in our last two sessions. So what we also see as we read through this passage of Scripture is that the Trinity is deeply involved in all of these operations. We determine this from verses 4, 5, and 6 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 
for instance, verse 4 says the same spirit, but different giftings. Verse 5 says the same Lord, but different ministries. Verse 6 says same God, but different activities. We see then that the, in the operation of the new martyr, there is a total involvement of the Godhead, as you would expect. Yet it is the Holy Spirit who has the onus of distribution. So in 1 Corinthians 12 and uh, verse 11, we see this. One and the same Spirit works all these things, <coughs> distributing to each one individually as he wills. On the other hand, whilst the Holy Spirit gives, the giving is not passive only. You see, we need to ask for the Holy Spirit. That, that is our responsibility. And so it's dependent upon our asking. I've heard some people have said to me, oh, well, if God wants me to have the Holy Spirit with this sign of speaking in tongues. It'll happen. No, we need to ask. Because in asking, it shows the desire of our heart to the Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 13, the scripture says, Let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. The gift of interpretation then comes as an individual desires to operate in that gift. And so we need to seek God for it. Note, if this gift can be received by asking, then surely the other gifts may also be obtained by asking. So what is the gift difference then between the gift and the sign of tongues? Well, the gift of tongues is a dual gift. That is, it's always used in operation with another gift. In this case, the other vocal gift is we've put these three together of interpretation. So what is the use of the gift? Well, firstly, we re need to recognize that this gift is for use in the church. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 14, verses 26 to 28, Whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let, it, let there be by two or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in church and let him speak to himself and to God. With this gift, you only speak when you know there is an interpreter present. Well, in most Pentecostal churches, I should say there should be at least several that have that gift. And at least uh, a pastor should be able to interpret a gift in tongues. And I believe some should be particularly gifted in this area as well. Now, some say you must never speak in tongues in church, that if you have the gift of, if you have the sign of tongues or if you have the ministry gift of tongues, then surely this tongues is only for private use. A little confusing maybe. But they quote Paul from 1 Corinthians 14, 19, where he says, Yet in the church I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. Well, let us travel a little bit further through 1 Corinthians 14 and come down to verse 28. He says, If there is no interpreter, let him speak to himself and to God. So in church, you are permitted to speak in tongues to yourself and to God as well. So that's part of the actual activity of this gift. Well, what was Paul saying then when he said, I would rather speak five words with my understanding than 10,000 words in a tongue in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 19. It's interesting that in that same passage, 1 Corinthians 14, 15, he says this, I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. He also says, I will sing with the Spirit and the understanding also. The fact that Spirit and understanding are in juxtaposition there shows us 
that when he's praying or singing in the Spirit, he doesn't have understanding. He's obviously using the gift of tongues. So what Paul was doing uh, here when he was talking about I'd rather speak five words is he's emphasizing what he had earlier stated as to the appointment of these gifts in the church, that there is a divine order of appointment and priority. In 1 Corinthians 12, 28 to 31, God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. So, no, tongues are at the bottom of the list, but they are on the list. So what is the operation then, you may ask, uh, as far as the gift is concerned? The operation is the same as prophecy. That is, it is under the direct control of the individual to speak or not to speak. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 32, the spirits, the scripture says, of the prophets are subject to the prophets. The Holy Spirit does not move through you without your consent. Let me say that. You can allow or quench the Spirit at any time. So, you know, Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica at 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 19 to 20 says, Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. If the Spirit is in tune with God's Spirit, you can speak but not when another is speaking. This was one of the problems of the church at Corinth. Everybody speaking out all at once, expecting to be heard and interpreted. Correspondingly, there was a, a real lack of humility and spiritual pride was probably there more evident than in any of the other churches. The existing problem was one of confusion. You see, in 1 Corinthians 14.33, it says, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. You know, when Paul gives a commendation to the Corinthian church in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 7 onwards there, he says that they lack none of the gifts, absolutely none of the gifts. In other words, they were all functioning within this church. But let me say, the overall motivation at all times in the operation of the gifts must be one of love. In 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, and you know that chapter very well. Now, when one is speaking, it must be out loud, clear, and for all to hear. Tongues should be spoken by course. That is, tongues followed by an interpretation. In 1 Corinthians 14, 27, it, it may be interpreted two different ways. Okay, and uh, the first aspect of this is three tongue messages given by the same person with one person interpreted. That's one way we can interpret this. Or alternatively, three different tongue messages by different people with one person interpreting. Or even three different people doing the interpreting, but one, te one tongue's message is only to be interpreted once. So the problem is that as we look at the scripture, we know that people are encouraged, but Paul here is emphasizing that there is to be a specific pattern about the way in which people conduct the utilization of the ministry of the Spirit and the gifts that they've called, uh, that they've been given in the local church. You see, nowhere does the scripture encourage a person who speaks in a tongue for the church to interpret his own tongue. And certainly, the tongue coupled with interpretation by the same individual is not to be used to give guidance or direction. That's not the, the utilization of these gifts. That's not what they're given for. Um, I've known of people who've gone off the rails by using this me method, either, you know, 
couple of people getting aside, you give a tongues message, I'll give you an interpretation and in a certain direction uh, follows that. Charlie, you shall marry Jill or some other stupid thing or, you know, and people even interpreting their own tongues and trying to take some direction from that. That's not what it is for. God has his counter checks built into the church for this reason. And so you may ask then, what does 1 Corinthians 14 verse 13 mean when it says, therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret? The answer comes from 1 Corinthians 14, 12 to 13. Since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Therefore, let him who speaks speaks in a tongue, pray that he may interpret. What Paul is encouraging here is the development of the spiritual gifts. If you have the gift of tongues, then zealously seek that you may pray for that, the dual part of that gift, which is interpretation. Zealously seek that. Paul suggests, therefore, that there is an order and there is a progression in vocal gifts, which actually depends upon your zeal, the want to exercise. As for, and we look at this as far as tongues, interpretation, and prophecy is concerned. So let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret in 1 Corinthians 14, 13. I wish, he says, you all spoke with tongues, but even more, that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 5. Now, so what I'm suggesting is that what we can see is that there's a progression of growth here. Therefore, we, we see it as beginning with tongues, moving then to interpretation, then moving on to prophecy. You see, tongues and interpretation equals prophecy. One's a dual process and uh, the other is a complete, more complete process. Less time consuming if you're on a constraint, probably, if you're thinking of it that way. But the dual gifts, tongues and interpretation, they have the same ministry to the church as prophecy Hence the exhortation to prophesy. Now, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 1 says, Desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Prophecy then is the highest level of the vocal gift. Now that's not deprecating tongues or interpretation. It's just where Paul categorizes prophecy. According to 1 Corinthians 14.3, it brings edification, exhortation and comfort to people in the church. This is the same ministry as the dual gift of tongues with interpretation because all may speak in tongues, but not all have the pneumata gift of tongues. See, one's a sign, the other's a gift. One is, can be used as... Uh, individually in your prayer time, etc., in your praise time, but the other is for interpretation in the church. So any message interpreted that does not bring comfort or edif edification has to be considered, therefore, as spurious in its operation, and at times it can be carnal in its content. Well, let's look, shall we, for a moment or two at other uses. Tongues also have another use. They serve as a sign to the unbeliever in 1 Corinthians 14 verses 22 to 25. Now, I want to just talk a little bit about this. When I was in university, that's when I, I came to know Christ as my personal Lord and Saviour. And I had a friend, uh, a good Christian friend, who was encouraging me uh, in the faith and he also, we, we were there were five of us in this house flatting together, and uh, this night he came home and uh, he had an Indian uh, boy with him, a friend, uh, whom I hadn't met before, and he's and he'd, uh, he sat him down and he said, uh, and I can't think of the boy's name, he said to him, "Look, 
he said, uh, tell Gladwin your testimony. And I thought, okay, yeah, yeah, I'd like to hear it. So he was telling me uh, how he went into this church and it was the first time somebody had invited him to that church and he was sitting there and he said, suddenly a woman down the front of the church began speaking in tongues. And then uh, across the other side of the church, a woman interpreted. And uh, he said there were three occurrences of this and each time this other woman spoke in tongues and this other one interpreted and it got him very, very excited. So the reason he got excited was he knew the language and he went rushing down to the front after the service and he said to this woman that was speaking in tongues because he knew the language, it was a dialect from a village that he had come from, not far from where he had lived in India. And uh, he said, oh, when are you at? And I can't think of the name of the village now. I apologize for that. But he asked her, when did you visit that village? How did you, how long were you there? How did you learn that language? And she said to him, I've never been there and I've never learned the language and tried to explain to him what it was. And then so he went across to the other woman who had interpreted it. And he said, when were you in this village? When did you uh, travel to India? And she said, I've never been to India. I've never been to that particular village. He said, well, I know the dialect. And there was this confusion. And the pastor, noticing him actively engaged with these two women, went across and said, what is it, young man? And uh, he said, look, I know this language that this woman was speaking. And this woman interpreted it exactly the way that this lady over here expressed that message during the church service. So the pastor sat him down and explained it to him. That night, he received Jesus Christ as his Lord and Saviour. You see, it's a sign to the unbeliever but prophecy is mainly to the believer. That's what scripture says. And I thought that was a, uh, it was a great encouragement to me uh, at that point of time uh, because I'd been seeking the Holy Spirit and had only just received speaking in tongues. In verse 22 of 1 Corinthians 14, it says, prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Here is declared the main reason for prophecy bringing God's word to believers. But there is an exception where its outworking is for the unbeliever or uninformed person. Verse 25, that the secrets of his hearts are revealed. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. So Paul's words on tongues are these. Do all have gifts of healings? Do all have do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret, but earnestly desire the best gifts? The answer, of course, is no. It's a gift. It's an endowment. It's an activity of the Spirit. It's something that you receive when you pray to God for it. Some say tongues are not for today. They passed away with the early church, and they quote 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 to 9, to explain their disappearance. Whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. So, if uh, tongues have gone and prophecies are no longer, is knowledge there? Has knowledge vanished? No, knowledge is forever increasing. Um, and, and it's no good just... Uh, you know, reinterpreting prophecy as inspired preaching. That doesn't do either. But one of the things that we do notice when we study revivals uh, right through world history is that frequently there is this manifestation of tongues. There are some commentators who claim that prophecy, though, is inspired preaching. Well, you know, they can, they can do that as much as they like. Um, but I have heard the prophetic word, I understand the prophetic word, I understand the operation of the prophetic word. We were uh, many years back travelling into another country and uh, we had a prophetic word over us before we went that when we travelled into this country, a young man would come up to me and uh, he would say, Pastor Gladwin, 
and my wife and I have been praying and we believe that God is uh, telling us to link ourselves and to you and to your ministry. The prophetic word went on and said, embrace us, young man, because we'll be able to do there what we have done in other countries. And that's exactly what happened. And uh, so today there are around 150 odd uh, churches in that country. You know, we have to ask the question, has inspired preaching gone? Has knowledge gone? No, knowledge has increased. And according to Joel, so will prophecy. Has tongues gone? Well, obviously, to me, the answer is no. We need to see these manifestations of these gifts occurring on a more regular basis in churches today. I mean, what's a church that doesn't have any evidence of the power of God within it? In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 10, we see this. When that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part will be done away. So again, we must ask the question, is that which is perfect come? Ah, uh, you know, it can't. I can't believe that it can allude to anything other than the return of Christ. And whichever way you see that and whichever doctrinal sense you try and examine that, I think it, uh, it is dependent upon the return of Christ, that which is perfect. In 1 Corinthians 13, 12, we know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And that particularly is speaking to the now. We only know in part. And so... As we come to the end of this session, I just want to leave those thoughts with you today that we need to distinguish between, yes, the, uh, the gift of prophecy and the sign of the uh, Holy Spirit in his activity as we enter into that place, that place of receiving the Spirit that place of being able to speak in tongues for our own personal edification and in the place of in prayer as opposed to the gift of tongues, which when accompanied with the gift of interpretation is equal to prophecy and brings about the edification, the exhortation and the comfort of the saints. God bless you.